my heart more than anything else at that camp was our high school counselors sharing their testimonies, I am second. Talking about their issues. They became vulnerable in front of kids. So the kids will realize this is real. If people that I look up to, my counselors in my cabin are sharing their struggles, you know what? Those kids can share their struggles. It was the counselors, it was the leaders that gave their testimonies, that gave the sermons, that gave their life for that week. These kids became pliable. These kids realized having struggles in their life is real. They don't have to play the game like mom and dad does of putting on the facade and act like everything is a-okay. When they go home, they realize it ain't okay. They realize that and they come open and they, take, they, can, they become transparent because others have become transparent. You know, struggles with our second, third, fourth, and fifth graders are real because the struggles with mom and dad are real. And until we realize we have struggles in our life, until we realize that God can only fix our struggles, what we're going to do is come in and we're going to play the game of church and play the game of the facade and we go home. But I believe we're not satisfied. I don't believe we can be satisfied with a fake life. I think the only way that we can have the joy that's set before us is if we give our life to Christ and allow God to work within our struggles. But in our struggles, we have to become very self-aware. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 precedes a chapter called chapter 11. That's pretty smart, huh? you know, 11 and 12. And chapter 11 is the Faith Hall of Fame. It lists men and women of faith. They gave their life for Christ, and some of them died. And they said, these were men and women of faith, great characters of the Bible. And he said, we're, we're surrounded by these men and women of faith. The Bible says that the Christians is located like a soldier, a farmer, and a teacher. And now it's relating to a race of faith. And it says that, that we have an example that is set before us of men and women in the Old Testament that ran the race of faith. And we can look at them and we can see what they did. And because of their faith, we can have the motivation to move forward. We have to have somebody to look up to. We have to have somebody that we can look back to and say, if they ran that race of faith, I can run the race of faith. It may not have been easy. It may have been difficult. But they were willing to run the race. And I can run that race. And in Romans chapter 12, he started saying, guys, here it is. Here's your struggles. At the end of the race, when you're ready to quit, when you're ready to give up, the struggles are so real. Here's what we really need to do. In verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 1, it says, therefore, and whenever, therefore, it says, okay, you have to look at it. That's what I was just talking about. The faith race. Since we are surrounded by such a crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated at the place of honor beside God. It's always something, isn't it? You can wake up and you say, it's always something. Always something is falling apart. I always have to go through something. The struggle is going on. There's always something going on. You're always coming through a struggle or you're in a struggle or you're about ready to go through a struggle, but there's always something. How do you do and how do you deal with there's always something? If you could sum up your life, you'd say we struggle with kids, our spouse, our job, our walk with the Lord. We struggle with money, understanding each other's, understanding our fears, the wars that goes on within us. The struggle is real. It's fearful. But I want to share with you some things the first area of where those struggles come from. Why do we struggle? Once we give our life to Christ, 
Shouldn't our life be an utopia life? Shouldn't we not have any troubles? Well, they come in three areas. The first enemy to our struggle is the battle inside of us, and that's the flesh. You know, I wish it had been so awesome that the day I gave my life to Christ that I would never sin again or I would never have the temptation to sin again. But maybe that's me. Maybe you guys don't have that temptation. But the flesh inside of me is weak. The thing I want to do, I don't do. But the thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing it and I struggle with my flesh. My struggle is probably more me than anything else. The struggle of myself. I get in front of myself and I get in trouble myself because of my flesh, our old nature and our new nature. And then the battle around you, which is the world, our culture. You're not the smartest, you're not the prettiest. The world would say you're not important. But that's only 99.999% of us. We're not all the prettiest. Mike, sorry about that. We're not all the smartest. We all have issues. Our culture, our world would say Christianity is a waste. And we struggle because of our culture. Christianity is anti-cultural. We are going against what the culture says. We're going upstream. And then the battle in you, the battle around you, and then the battle against you. You know who hates you? Satan. He absolutely despises you. The devil can't beat God but the devil wants to defeat you. He wants to defeat you through depression. He wants to de defeat you through uh, just being lazy and lackadaisical and saying it's not important and I'll go through my life on coast mode and I need to stand, I need to fight, and I need to say, get thee behind me, Satan, because my life is important. I've got to do that. And if I don't do that, Satan will just say, kick back, enjoy life. I've got this thing under control. And there's days in our life that we just have to say, no more. I am tired of the facade. I'm tired of the struggle. I'm tired of living a life of a lie. What do you want to do about it? Well, in those three verses I read, there are five points that if we can apply those five points we can look at those points and say, you know what? I am going to identify. Don't look at your spouse. Don't look at your boyfriend. Don't look at somebody else and say, you needed that. You know what? We all need this. Every one of us struggle. If I could ask you to be honest, you could list me five struggles that you have right now that nobody else knows about that you secretly deal with and you don't want anybody to know about it. You have struggles. You have issues. You have things that you are dealing with that you are allowing God not to be in charge of. You are allowing Satan to be in charge of it. You have to deal with those things. And if we don't deal with those things, it's going to be deja vu next month, next year, about the same struggles, the same fights, the same insecurities. The first one is remember the saints showed us that running the race is okay. Remember the saints showed us how to run that race of faith. Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Now, when I was earlier in my life and as a pastor, they taught me this a little differently than reality. They taught me and they tell us that well, this is kind of like a stadium and, and all the saints that have gone before you are in the stadium and they're watching you. They're watching your life and they're watching what you're doing and they're cheering you on in life. But let me tell you, this is about what they did. It's not what they are doing. Let me tell you, when you pass and you're a saint of God, the absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body and the present with the Lord, there's no more tears in heaven. We're, we're not watching the sin of the world. When we die, we're in heaven and we're having fellowship with God. We're worshiping him. We're learning of him. We are not down looking and watching what's taking place on this earth. How could there be no more tears in heaven if we're watching the sin on earth? The heartbreak that you're going through. We have one job when we die and go to heaven. That's to spend eternity with Christ. The word of God is our example. The saints that went before us are our example. Our father and our mother are not watching us from heaven worrying about what you're going to do. They have set that example and now they're in heaven. But God... God says, they have run the race before you. 
Listen to what Job chapter 31 verse 4 says. Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Does he not count? He sees everything. God sees all. There is nothing hidden from God. Everything that is done is done in the view of God, not in the view of the saints. God sees all. Nothing you do in your life is secret. But we need to know that if we're going to struggle, we have somebody that understands our struggle. And God understands our struggle. So when we know that God understands our struggle, and we know that we've had the Bible, we've had saints, we've had Moses and, and, and Joshua and Noah, men of faith that have stood up and they've walked great things, and you get to heaven, you can look at, let me tell you about my struggle. Let me tell you what I had to do. And then Noah would say, really? <laughs> you got to struggle like that? Trying to build a stinking boat? I have to struggle. Moses would say, <laughs> really? Try to lead millions of people for 40 years in the desert. They are gripers. They don't like anything. They wanted to discommunicate me from the church. We have struggles. The men and women of faith in chapter 11 are there to encourage us because of what they have gone through. But then, it gets serious. We have God. We have the Word of God. We have the saints to encourage us. But then he starts getting serious. He says this, eliminate what doesn't matter. Eliminate what doesn't matter. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. The weight is anything that slows you down from the way God's race needs to be ran. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes our relationships weigh us down. Sometimes we must reevaluate our relationships. No, I'm not talking about our marriages. I'm talking about well, there's some things that we need to fix in every relationship. But there are some relationships that are slowing you down. And it could be some activities that you're involved in. The weight isn't sin. The weight is something that is holding you back. It could be a good thing, but it's weighing you down from doing what God wants you to do. Sometimes it could be your sports teams. I tell you what, the Cowboys are weighing me down. I mean, it is a struggle to be a Cowboy fan. Sunday afternoon at 12 o'clock, it's depression every day. So I kind of switched over to the Chiefs because at least now one of the teams is going to win maybe. But sometimes sports, sometimes we get so overwhelmed with our activities, we forget that our activities are there to bring glory to God. We weigh ourselves down. We get caught up. We don't do what God wants us to do because of our weights. And sometimes in this culture, it would have been the weight of legalism. Jews coming in and getting in their life to Christ. And they're coming out of this legalism. So what they're doing is they're trying to give their faith to Christ, but yet they're holding on to their life. They're holding on to their past. They're holding on to the Jewish religion and the Jewish custom. And it's weighing you down. How can I be full of faith, grace, and love towards Jesus, but still hold on to the legalism of my past? And sometimes our past, let me say it over here, our past is our greatest weight. Sometimes it's our past that we're wondering, oh, I loved my past. It was awesome. And we hold on to our past so we can't do anything in the future because we want to live back here where everything was great. And sometimes our past was horrendous. And we can't forgive and we can't move on. And the weight of our past is holding us down. And Jesus said through Paul, get rid of the weight of life. If you can't run your race because of the weight of your life, get rid of it. Cut it off. Cut it out. Get rid of it. Because the weight that is holding you back is keeping you from the joy that I have set before you. And if you want to live a life of victory, if you want to live a life of joy, don't live in the past. It could have been wonderful. It could have been the best thing that you've ever had. But if we always look behind us and say, I wish I lived there, I wish I had that, we'll never see what God has in store for us tomorrow. Because I promise you, tomorrow is better than yesterday. 
If you have faith in that, we have to get rid of the weight. Get rid of the weight. Discipline of saying no to good things. Every good thing in life can overwhelm us. If you're burning your candle at both ends, you're not very bright. Anybody? Because sooner or later you're going to burn out and burn up. We have to learn to say no. It's easier sometimes to fill a schedule than to fulfill the schedule. And sometimes we fill our schedule so full of stuff we haven't fulfilled anything. And there is no life of fulfillment. There's a filled schedule, but no joy within that schedule. To grow, I must be able to say no. To grow, I must be able to say no. There are things within our life I have to say no to. It is a weight. A weight can be a memory, a positive or negative. It could be a tradition. A self-evaluation of our life must be made. And sometimes we have to clean the spiritual clutter out of our life. Sometimes it's good. But not everything good is necessary. And sometimes we have to evaluate what is right and what is wrong. And that is the weight. And then it says, and the sin that so easily besets us. What is sin? Let me give you an easy definition. Sin is knowing what to do and not doing it. Knowing what to do and not doing it. James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him who know to do good and does not do it, it is sin. Here's the issue. We know what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit has prompted us. When we sin, if you are a believer and you sin, the Holy Spirit is convicting you. If you are sinning and you're not being convicted, the Holy Spirit is not in you. So when you sin, when you do things wrong and you feel guilty and you feel convicted, that is God saying, get on your knees, confess your sin, turn around and stop it. Stop it. Who was that? Bob Hartman? Hartman said, stop it. Just stop it. You got a problem? Just stop it. It's not that easy. But when we have a sin that's easily besetting us, in other words, we trip on it all the time. We see something, we fail. We want something, we fail. Stop it. We have to learn because it easily besets us. It doesn't say you got to lay a trap and it's a major ordeal. The sin that easily trips us up. You know what the Bible says? We just don't want to do what it says. In our relationships, in our monies, and in our addictions, we sometimes need to give our life to him. If it easily trips us up, you know what it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't take a rocket science, brain surgeon to figure out that if I get tripped up all the time. Um, one of my favorite books is John Maxwell says, uh, Failing Forward. I'm going to give you this illustration. In Failing Forward, he says, when you fall, pick something up. He said, many times, we fall or we trip up. Has you, have you ever been walking and you trip over your feet and then you hurry up and look around and make sure nobody watched you do it? Anybody ever do that? Well, that's what we do spiritually and that's what we do in relationships. We're walking around and all of a sudden we trip on ourselves, we fall on our face and we hurry up and get up and hope nobody saw. And what John Maxwell says is when you trip, stay down there long enough and figure out what you tripped over. Because if you don't figure out why you tripped, you will trip again. And we must learn from our failures. If we want to win in life, we have to understand, I have obstacles and I have things that will make me trip. A sin that so easily besets me, I have to put guardrails around or I will trip on that every time. It doesn't say that it's hard to trip on. The Bible says a sin that easily besets us. If we do not guard that, it will make us fall. And then, run God's race for me. Run God's race. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Not that your mommy and daddy set before you. Not that your preacher set before you. Not even what you want to do. 
The Bible says, and run the race with endurance, with patience, with determination, the race that God himself has set. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your ministry. He has a plan for your marriage. He has a plan for your kids. Run the race. Run the life that God has set before you. The Olympics are getting ready to start next Friday. And I love the idea of the Olympics. I love, I love the track and field in the Olympics. And uh, I know that you don't know this, but I was a runner. <laughs> don't laugh. I was a runner. When I was in high school, I was skinny. I was fast. Things happen. I'm 52. I'm fat and slow. I was, I was moving Brett's dresser out of his bedroom last night or yesterday. So, I was, you know, he's 25 and he's moving to Kansas City. And wouldn't, wouldn't a 25-year-old walk backwards? No, not him. He makes the old man walk backwards. So here I am carrying this, tra this, this heavy outside because it wouldn't go through the door. We had a, a going up the step. And I fell. I fell. I, I, I rolled down the hill. And you know what? I am doing this for this punk kid that I'm supposed to love. And he said, no, you know what he did to me? He laughed. <laughs> I'm rolling down the hill, and he's laughing at me. And on the inside, I'm saying, like, man. And I said, I remember when I was 24 years old, I'd have carried that dresser by myself on my back, and my dad would have encouraged me. But not that boy. <laughs> not that boy. But I was one day a young man. And I used to run track. And back in the day, in the 1980s, it wasn't meters, it was yards. It was the 440-yard dash. Now it's the 400 meter. Back in the day, it was the 440. And I was a 100-yard dash man. But the 440 guy, he didn't show up for the track meet, and there was a hole. And the coach says, Thomas, you're going to run the 440. <laughs> All right, bring it on. And I was a freshman. I was a freshman, and when you're a freshman, you're not near as big as the seniors. And you're not near as bad as the seniors. But when you were in eighth grade, you were a stud. You, you could beat all those sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And I thought, okay, bring it on. So I brought it on. I got in that block, and I knew one speed at a 100-yard dash. What is it? 100 miles an hour. You go 100%, and you start, and you finish. So I got in that block. They shot that gun off, and I ran, and I did really good for about 150 yards. All of a sudden, my legs turned to jelly. I thought I was going to die. I started seeing stars. I was in the lead, and I thought, man, if I could just hold on, if I could hold on, this, I'm going to be the first freshman ever to win this race until about the 200-meter mark. And guess what? All these seniors, zoom, 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 zoom. And I was, <laughs> but I crossed the line. I crossed the line. And you know what? All those guys were laughing at me. They said, man, you need to learn pace. You can't run a 400 like you won a 100. Everybody has a race that God has given to them. If you are a dash man and you're trying to run the mile race and you run the mile race like you would a 100-yard dash, you will fail. God has a plan for your life. Now, I could have said, hey, I was in the lead at 100 yards. Can I get the goal, gold medal for the 100 yards that I did win? You know what? You aren't going to get the medal until the race is over. And if you don't pace your life and run the race that God has in store for you, you're going to be sitting on the sideline, gashing with air, wondering what's taking place, because we do not know how to run our race. So let me give you ways to run the race. First of all, stop worrying about the approval of others and focus on God. We cannot worry about what other people think of you. In the blocks, I thought I was going to win. At 100 yards, I thought I was going to win. And I was wondering, like everybody, they're going to know who I am. And guess what? They figured out who I was. <laughs> the loser that came in last. They laughed at me and they knew my name, but it wasn't from the top. It was from the back. Here's what we do. In the book, Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren, he gives us in that uh, an acrostic of shape to know what you're called to do in your life and in the church. He gives us, it's called shape. And the S stands for your spiritual giftedness. 
What are you spiritually gifted in doing? Is it in leadership? Is it administration? Is it in teaching? Is it in hospitality? What is your spiritual gift? You know, your spiritual gift is what God has given to you to do. And every one of us have spiritual gifts. God has given to us spiritual gifts when we gave our life to Christ. What is it that you naturally can do for God and God gifted you in? What is it? What is it that you like to do? What is it that you're motivated to do? What is it that when something happens, you say, I want to do that. I want to serve in this area. It is your shape. It is your spiritual giftedness. And the second thing, it is your heart. It is your heart. What are you passionate about? If you have passion about it, if, if, if it's not work, if it's what God wants you to do and he spiritually gifted you and you have passion or your heart about it, and then you're doing it because you love Jesus and you love kids or you love music or you love spirituality, what is your heart? And then what is your abilities? Sometimes we want to do something that we're not gifted in and then we fall out of it because we're not gifted because of it. So if, if, you're, not, if, if you're not gifted in that area, then it may not be the area that you want to serve. But here's the last two I believe are the primary ones. Your personalities. God gave to you your personality. Now, your personality does not change when you give your life to Christ. You are the same person without Christ as you are in Christ with your personality. Your personality is who you are. It's the essence of who you are. So whether you're sanguine, whether, whether your, your temperament is, is, is calm or whether it's outgoing, it makes no difference. It's who you are, your personality. And God uses your personality in your gift mix. And then your experience. Your experience. God never wastes your experience. Whether they're good, whether they're bad, or whether they're ugly. God never wastes an experience. Now, we may not like the experience that we go through, but after we're through with that experience, after we've gone through the struggle, we have the ability to love and to help somebody else that is going through the struggle, the shape that you're in. Your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personalities, and your experiences. God doesn't intend rabbits to fly. He doesn't intend eagles to swim, and he doesn't intend fish to run. He expects them to do as he created them to do. And we need to do what God has created us to do. If we're struggling in our spiritual life, if we're struggling in serving, it's because maybe we don't understand our shape. We don't understand what he has called us to do. Maybe we're trying to do something that he has not called us to do. Maybe we're not doing what he wants us to do. And what we must do is we must get in shape. And then the fourth thing is focus on Jesus and not your circumstances. Focus on Jesus and not your circumstances. In verse 2 it says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion and the initiates and perfects our faith. We can't keep our eyes on the crowd, on the critics, or on the circumstances. We can't keep our eyes on Facebook and how many likes you have or the comments people make. Facebook is of the devil. <laughs> we all use it. But sometimes we need to not worry about what Facebook has to say about your position because Facebook could come back and hurt us. If we keep in our eyes on Jesus, we wouldn't be looking at the computer screen all the time. We must look at Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. And sometimes we go through struggles. Jesus is up here saying, I want to help you. I want to serve you. I want to be beside you. But we're down here looking at our checkbook and not Jesus. We look at our pains instead of Jesus. We look at our surroundings instead of Jesus. We look at our insecurities instead of Jesus. We listen to our critics instead of Jesus. And all of a sudden, we start believing what people say instead of listening to what Jesus has to say. And if we're children of God, we are God's children. It makes no difference what somebody says. It makes a difference what he says. And when we listen to what he says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, my life, my salvation, I want to be honest with you. I love you, 
But I'm not going to give up my life. I'm not going to give up my salvation. I'm not going to give up my eternity because I want you to like me. I'm not, I can't. I love Jesus too much for that. What I want to do is I want to hear you. I want to minister to you. But I'm not going to allow you to determine my life. I want Jesus to determine my life. I want to run the race that he has set for me. Nobody else. Can't do it for anybody else. It has to be Christ. You know, when they train dogs, um, I'm, I'm a, such a good dog trainer, by the way. <laughs> I couldn't even train the dog I had. But here's what they do in, in obedience school. They set the master over here and the dog on the other side of the room. And the dog needs to hear what the master's voice sounds like. The dog's trained to look at the master and what the master asked him to do with hand motions or with voice controls. But after they try to train, then they put an obstacle in the middle. You know what the obstacle is for dog? It's a bowl of dog food. So the dog is over here looking at the master. The master's over there already trying to teach him hand movements. Set, stand, roll, whatever he has to do. Obedience. So the master says, come. If the dog stops, he's lost control. But if the dog looks at the master's control and he walks past the dog food, then he's, uh, he's done his job. So often, when we look at the master and our eyes are on him, we can be obedient to God. But sooner or later, we did come distracted with the food of this world, the joy of this world, the happiness of of this world. And we don't care what the master says because I'm sitting here enjoying what I want. I don't care what he's asking me to do. I'm enjoying the life. I am enjoying the world's food and I'm not really listening to Jesus. Y'all have heard of Corey Timbu, who the Christian who helped in Holland um, the Jews out of Nazi and all of a sudden they came in and they arrested her and her family and they put her into the concentration camp. She wrote a book called The Hiding Place. This is her quote. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at rest. You know, if you look at what the world has for offering us, it is very distressful. If you look at what the world says about you or what you think about yourself, you're going to be depressed. But then if you can look at God and wrap your arms around him, then you can finally be at rest. I can worry or I can worship. I can panic or I can pray. Listen to what Jonah said in the belly of a whale. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into the holy temple. My prayer. When I am down, when I am out, when I have no hope, and when I am discouraged, I know I have Jesus. Keep our eyes on him. The author and the finisher of our faith. It is what we must do. And the fifth and the most important. Minimize the pain and maximize the reward. We're talking about your struggles. We're talking about your issues. We're talking about your insecurities and the failures of your life. Verse 2, I love this verse. This is Spencer. We're Spencer. This is Spencer's life verse. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. Jesus knew what was ahead of him. He knew the joy. He knew what he had to go through. He knew that he was going to be disrespected beaten and crucified. But he knew what was ahead of him. Despising the shame, he knew what the joy was going to be. And now he said at the right hand side of the Father, everything is, a, everything is worth doing it takes pain. If, 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 if You can't do anything without pain. Whether you, you're, it's your education, it takes pain. Most people in this world would like to just ignore the problems that we have. But I tell you, in the third world problem, I guarantee you, this third world, they would exchange your problem, your struggle, with theirs any day of the week. We need to understand, we have an opportunity to put God where he needs to be. 
what God wants for us. You know, there's a great illustration, and his illustration is Paul, about what he went through. And when you're looking at your struggles, I think we need to put our struggles in perspective. I do not want to minimize your struggle, but we do want to maximize God's power. And if we get caught up in our struggle and not look at God in our struggle, we're going to get caught up down here and we'll never get out of it. But we have to have an example. And Paul was a great example. I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am not more. In laborers more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day. I have been in the deep. In journeys often in perilous waters. Perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils of false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things that comes upon daily for the fellowship of the church. That's what Paul went through. Beaten, shipwrecked, Naked, alone, deserted, people against him in the church, people against him against, uh, without the church. And then but go back to chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though we are outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for a more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. Everything he went through, he knew what was ahead of him. And he was shipwrecked, beaten, abused, tormented. And then he says, but you know what? In the light of what's going to take place tomorrow, that's a light affliction. The weight of of glory is much greater. The future is much greater. What we must do is lay aside the weight. Lay aside the sin. Lay aside today what is hindering you from glory, from what God wants for your life. The sin that so easily besets us. The weight of our life that keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. The race that you're living that God wants you to run. What is keeping you from doing that? And the thing, the struggle, the insecurity, the fear is keeping you from doing what God wants you to do, the joy that is set before him. You want joy? You want peace? You want that satisfaction? You want to know that God loves you, that God is working within your life? Don't get caught up in the struggles Give God the struggles. Focusing your eyes on the prize. Focusing your eyes on Jesus. Until we can be honest about me, I will never focus on him. Until I know what my life is about, I will never focus on what Jesus wants me. But when we allow the struggles of our life to be put in the hands of God. And say, Lord, I can't do this. I'm tired of it. I'm frustrated in it. My life stinks as I know it. I need to give it to you. I need to give the weight to you. I may even bow my head and say, the sin that so easily besets me, I got to give it to you. The race that I'm running that's not what you want me to run, I need to give it to you. The relationships that I'm in that I'm struggling in, I need to give them to you. And when I can do that, I can say, Lord, I have fought the fight. I have ran the race. And I am so looking forward to what you have in store for me. If you're tired of the struggles, if you're tired of fighting, if you're tired of the frustrations, 
You're tired of the sin. You're tired of the lack of joy. You're tired of not knowing what God wants to do within your life. I'm going to ask you to focus your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes off of the junk. Raise them up and look at Jesus. And let him give you direction. Let him give you that peace. Let him take the struggles and the fears and the failures that you have and let him wrap his arms around you and love you. And when you wake up, you can have a joy, you can have a peace, and you can have that determination that God loves you and he wants to take your struggles from you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we do thank you. We need you. Lord, we need you to hear our hearts. The weights are heavy. The sin is real. We trip up all the time. And it's nothing new to you because you understand that and you love us through that. But Lord, right now I just ask you to be with our hearts and be with our lives. Lord, not to be entertained, but to be changed. Not to listen, but to learn. Lord, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit's grip upon our life will be one that's not just uncomfortable, but one that will be transformable. So Lord, make us. Make us to make an action. Compel us to change. Give us that desire to allow you to take over our life. We ask you for that. We thank you for that. We need you, Lord, to do that. In Jesus' name we do pray.